On October 7, 2019, Drs. Greg Semenza, Peter Radcliffe, and William Kalin were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their work uncovering the role of hypoxic response in health and disease. Decades ago, each sought to answer the question of how kidney cells sense and respond to low oxygen levels to ultimately stimulate the production of red blood cells and enhance oxygen delivery throughout the body. At the time, the nature and mechanism of hypoxic response was unknown and thought to be limited to a small subset of kidney cells. Exploring this basic science question, Dr. Semenza, Radcliffe, and Kalin discovered that the hypoxic response is far more widespread than originally thought. Universally underlying core cellular processes and tissues in cell types. The transcription factor that regulates it all, called hypoxia-inducible factor, plays central roles in disease from kidney disease to cancer, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and even immune regulation. These discoveries have opened up entirely new fields of research in medicine, with hip-targeted treatments now yielding promising clinical trial results across a spectrum of diseases. Keystone Symposia is particularly vested in this story as we have watched this emerging field unfold over the last two decades from a basic science exploration into a translational arena. Since 2004, our hypoxia meetings have provided a venue for these thought leaders to share their ideas and showcase their latest research, coming together with diverse academic, clinical, and industry audiences to discuss and direct the state of the field. It is only fitting that this year's meeting in January, which marks the 10th Keystone Symposia on Hypoxia, features all three Nobel laureates on the program. We are honored to host Dr. Semenza, Radcliffe, and Kalin, along with their colleagues, for this meeting of the minds as the field of hypoxia takes center stage around the world. Here we catch up with each of these research leaders to discuss this journey from obscurity into the limelight and the future of this exciting field. Let me just start by congratulating you. It's a very exciting time. Um, we're very excited to have you be coming to the Hypoxia Conference in January. Can you describe what question you started out your career trying to answer and the journey it has taken you on? And what were your goals or aspirations setting out and have these changed? As a clinician, I knew that people who have inherited an altered version of the VHL gene and who develop so-called von Hippel-Lindau disease develop a variety of uh, tumors, including kidney cancers and hemangioblastomas, which are blood vessel tumors of the eye, uh, brain, and spinal cord, as well as paragangliomas. And I also knew as a clinician that the, uh, these tumors that develop in von Hippel-Lindau disease, they're very rich in blood vessels, and they occasionally also stimulate red blood cell production. So mm -hmm. I also thought by studying the BHL gene, we might learn something about the molecular control of angiogenesis. Uh, the trifecta here would be we'd also learn something about the, the molecular control of oxygen sensing and how cells sense and adapt to changes in oxygen. And again, as a clinician, I knew that there were many uh, diseases uh, where uh, altered oxygen delivery is an important feature. And so uh, fortunately, all those hunches turned out to be relatively mm. good uh, hunches. And the last hunch uh, ultimately led to that very nice phone call a couple of weeks ago. So there's something specifically interesting or different about those kinds of tumors that you were studying. All, all solid tumors have some uh, regions that are hypoxic. And so I, I think all tumors struggle with how to survive in a low oxygen environment. And so certainly increased angiogenesis, for example, is, a, is, is seen in other tumors, but it's just exaggerated, if you will, in the tumors that are linked to mutations in the VHL gene. Okay. Uh, so it's really a, a very conspicuous feature of these VHL associated tumors. In fact, in the pre CAT scan era, the diagnostic procedure of choice for patients suspected of having a kidney cancer was to do a renal angiogram and to look for this uh, proliferation of new uh, blood vessels in the, in the tumor and in the surrounding tissues. Uh, and these hemangioblastomas I alluded to a moment ago, they're really primarily uh, vascular uh, proliferations. Mm. Uh, uh, they're balls of blood vessels. And, and so it's a very conspicuous feature of these tumors uh, that's, that, that, that I would say is exaggerated, if you will, compared to other uh, solid tumors. Uh, the ability to stimulate red blood cell production, however, is, is a more unique feature of 
these VHL associated tumors. Were there any moments along the way that you were realized that you might be onto something really big here and that all these hunches were really coming to fruition? As we had predicted from the clinical features of the tumors, when we looked at the, the matched cells that lacked an intact version of the VHL gene, uh, these cells produced hypoxia inducible mRNAs at high levels, whether they were getting oxygen or not. Mm. Uh, and so to my knowledge, this was the first example of a, of a mammalian gene that when disrupted uh, led to a loss of uh, oxygen uh, sensing. By the late 90s, we knew that the VHL protein was important for oxygen sensing. Uh, and we had biochemically defined what was likely to be a ubiquitin uh, uh, ligase. And then we got a big break in 19, 1999 when Patrick Maxwell and Peter Radcliffe published their landmark paper in Nature showing that cells lacking the VHL protein could not uh, destroy the alpha subunits of the so-called HIF transcription mm -hmm. factor or uh, hypoxia inducible factor. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, HIF is a master regulator of many of these hypoxia inducible uh, mRNAs. And so based on that clue, we immediately showed that indeed uh, VHL, the v, this VHL uh, putative ubiquitin ligase complex binds directly to the HIF alpha subunits and marks them for degradation provided oxygen is present. But that still begs the question, how does the VHL protein know, if you will, whether oxygen is or is not present and mm -hmm. hence whether it should or should not destroy HIF. And so then uh, our group and Peter Reckless group working independently and in parallel discovered that the signal uh, was prolyl hydroxylation of the HIF alpha uh, subunit. How are these now being used to transform medicine, treatments, um, and also revealing other aspects in different diseases? Now, at the time we were discovering this, a number of pharmaceutical companies were already, develop, already developing inhibitors against the angiogenic growth factor, VEGF, hmm. which again is a well-studied HIP target. Uh, and so now we could A, begin to understand why VHL defective tumors are so angiogenic, it's because they overproduce VEGF. And we argued if VEGF inhibitors were gonna work against any solid tumors, the place that they were most likely to work would be these VHL mutant mm -hmm. tumors such as kidney cancers. Uh, fortunately, that's turned out to be the case, and I think there are now six or seven VEGF inhibitors approved for the treatment of uh, kidney cancer. Uh, and the HIP2 inhibitor is also uh, being tested now in patients with von hippo uh -huh. uh, disease, so we're very excited about that. Uh, conversely, now uh, we have ways of turning HIF on in conditions where the problem is, for example, not making enough red blood cells or mm -hmm. not delivering oxygen uh, well enough. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've been working with a company called Fibrogen, and I have a small financial interest in Fibrogen uh, for 20 years now, but there are other companies as well, developing orally available drugs that will inhibit those prolyl hydroxylases and so when you take these uh, drugs, uh, your body uh, s suddenly thinks, if you will, that, that it's at high altitude. Uh, HIF accumulates because it's not getting pro-hydroxylated, and it turns on pro-erythropoietic genes such as uh, EPO. And uh, those drugs also look very promising. I think the fibrogen compound is probably the furthest along. It's called Roxodustat, and that drug has been approved in China approved in Japan, and the U.S. submission is probably going to take place within the next uh, week. And this is based on uh, multiple positive phase three uh, studies. But again, there are other companies that are developing similar uh, pro hydroxylase inhibitors. So I think we have a whole new class of drugs for treating anemia, and we're hopeful in time these drugs might also be useful for dis diseases like heart attack and stroke, where you're not getting enough oxygen delivery to tissues. Great. Um, speaking of the drugs that are used to treat um, cancers to shut down the pathway, are any of those being looked at for other diseases beyond cancers? Uh, that's a very good question. So uh, I think there's certainly interest in using the HIF2 inhibitors and in some other diseases where uh, there's some evidence that HIF2 plays a role. And one that immediately comes to mind is uh, uh, pulmonary, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Hmm. Uh, there's also been some interest and exploring these drugs and some other conditions as well. Um, well, we very much look forward to your talk at the upcoming Keystone Symposia on Hypoxia in January. Uh, what do you look forward to at this year's Hypoxia meeting and what do you hope or expect will come out of it and where do you foresee the field is heading? <laughs>
Well, part of the reason I'm looking forward to the meeting is, uh, you know, although Greg, Peter, and I shared the prize, uh, on one level, this is a prize for the entire hypoxia uh, field. I mean, no one works in isolation. Uh, I can think of dozens and dozens and dozens of, of laboratories that made contributions here uh, that contributed to our current understanding of oxygen uh, sensing. So uh, although uh, I'm obviously thrilled to be chosen to receive the prize, I'm very much aware of the fact that this is really a team prize for the entire hypoxia signaling uh, field. So I, I hope we all have one heck of a party celebrating uh, <laughs> together because many, many people contributed to it. And of course, I go, uh, like any scientist, to be uh, educated about the state of the art and where the field is going. And I always learn something uh, at these meetings, just as in the past, I learned things that were you know, quite, quite, quite important for the work we were doing. And that's going to get recognized in Stockholm later this year. Great. Can you expand a little bit more on any um, particularly exciting insights or ideas or collaborations that came out of your involvement at past Keystone Symposia hypoxia meetings? Well, it was through these meetings that, uh, for example, I really got to know uh, Sir Peter Radcliffe and his group, as well as Greg's uh, group, but you know, countless other uh, laboratories. But I think anyone who's gone to a Keystone meeting knows that uh, you know, it's a great format. And then on top of it, of course, in addition to what you learn in the lecture halls, uh, you know, some of the best things you learn are on the uh, chair lifts or at the bar. <laughs> so I'm very much looking forward to those interactions as I always have in the past. Great. I do see from our records, you have a long history with Keystone Symposia. You've been yes. to over two dozen meetings in the last three decades and even organized a few. I've even organized a few, yeah. yes. Um, what keeps you coming back and involved with Keystone Symposia? Well, I think it's the, I think first and foremost, uh, you know, it's the, it's the quality of the people who are invited to speak. I mean, I alluded a moment ago to, I think the unstructured time is quite important as well. And sometimes the, the best interactions are the, the informal mm -hmm. uh, ones. And so I, I like the structure, I like the venues, uh, but I, I, it's just a, a place where you know you're gonna get quality in terms of the, the, the speakers and the presentations. Mm -hmm. Um, over those years, how have you seen the hypoxia field evolve throughout the meetings? Well, I think it's exploded. I think that the, uh, I think 20 years ago, uh, you know, this field uh, wasn't nearly as uh, popular or mainstream as it is uh, today. I think the field had to mature uh, a little bit uh, as it has, obviously. Uh, and so I think with each year, you see more and more interest. And of course, the other thing that happened is the science began to mature to a point where you actually had, you know, real world applications of, of the mm -hmm. knowledge that was being generated. So I think with the, you know, for example, with the VEGF inhibitors and now the uh, HIF stabilizers or the HIF2 antagonist, you now have much more interest from the uh, private sector in addition to the uh, interest from the public sector. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, do you have any particularly memorable moments from a Keystone Symposia or interactions that you've had that you'd like to share? Circa, circa the late 90s, I remember Paula Kaburstis, who was a relatively young editor at Science, met with me to have a cup of coffee and just asked me what was exciting in my uh, laboratory at the time. Uh, and uh, we really hadn't hit the phase of our VHL work where things were really happening very rapidly. A few years later, when we had the prolyl hydroxylation story, I submitted it to science and I specifically submitted it to her mm. because of the time she had spent with me at the Keystone meeting. And I think uh, both she and I would agree that that paper aged extremely uh, well, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of its citation history and now the, the, the wonderful recognition it, it generated. Uh, but years later, she confided in me that, you know, those stories that I had told her over coffee, uh, she, she just thought were really boring. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and, I, and, in, and in hindsight, I don't, I don't even disagree with her. Uh, <laughs> they, they were kind of boring in hindsight, but it was the best I had at the time. But I guess since she had invested the time in me and paid her dues, uh, I felt an allegiance to her. So I think hopefully it all worked out. Speaking of that, what is it like to go full circle and have these hunches and ideas and really 
see it all blossom, the field blossom, as well as clinically, to be able to treat these patients and things. You know, as I've gotten older, I find myself using the word privilege more and more. I'm just, I'm just re reminded that, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate. Uh, it's been a great privilege to ha have, you know, to be able to be a, a scientist and to come to work every day and feel like I'm playing rather than working. And, uh, and you know, we all know in science there's a fair amount of luck involved in this uh business you can do all the right experiments but get on interesting answers and so i will give myself credit for having planted myself in a fertile area when we started working on uh, vhl uh, but you know the, the oxygen sensing mechanism could have turned out to be far less elegant than it turned out to be far less satisfying than it turned out to be so i was just very fortunate in that regard uh, I, I also have had as, has, as would be the case with any successful scientist, I've had you know incredibly talented trainees in my laboratory who you know, did many of the pivotal experiments. And again, I could list you know twenty names of mm -hmm. people who worked in my lab without whom you know we wouldn't have succeeded. So uh, I've been very fortunate in that regard. Uh, and then finally, as you know, as a physician scientist, of course, and, and nothing feels better than to think that you know once in a while you actually did something that actually impacted. Uh, patients. It's a, it's a very satisfying feeling. And again, I use the word uh, privilege. I've just been very fortunate.